Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus from the University of Tsukuba. This is Experiment Designs for Computer Science, Lecture 3, Video 3, Statistical Inference. So in, this, in the last video, we talked about what was statistical testing and what was hypothesis testing and many things that we have to keep in mind when we're doing a hypothesis test. In this video, we will actually go through a few examples of, of new hypothesis testing. So first, let's start with the general procedure of a hypothesis test. The idea is that first we identify which parameter we are interested in. Oh. Huh. We identify which parameter we are interested in analyzing. And based on this parameter, we define uh, the new hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. And we also define when we're defining the alternate hypothesis, if it's one-sided, in other words, if the alternate hypothesis is the value of the parameter is different from x or one or two-sided, sorry, one-sided is uh, the value of the parameter is below or above x or two-sided, the value of the parameter is different than x. The difference between one-sided and two-sided is a very small difference in calculation. So we're not going to focus this on this, uh, on this course you can easily see uh, the difference by looking at the help, the help file of functions that calculate the tests that we're going to describe here. Now, uh, <clears throat> we determine the desired alpha and beta, and we define the minimal interesting effect size delta. After all of this, we calculate the sample size. Uh, we're not going to calculate the sample size on this lecture. This will be in a future lecture. And we determine the test statistic and critical region. Remember that test statistic here is a function calculated on the sample data. And critical region is the area of the, the value of the test statistic that we use to define whether we reject the new hypothesis or if we do not reject the new hypothesis. Now, finally, we use we calculate the statistic from the data and we use this information to decide whether or not to reject the new hypothesis so let's imagine a second example this time we're going to use the following example for a certain brand of peace we want to ex determine if there is any significant deviation from the mean weight of the sacks from from an advertised amount so there is a brand that is selling peace and they are advertised that the mean value is 50 kilos. You want to take those P's and you want to calculate if this advertisement is true or false. So in this case, your new hypothesis is, yes, the advertisement is true, and the mean weight of the sacks is 50 kilos. Your alternate hypothesis is that, no, the advertisement is not true, and the value of the sacks is different from 50 kilos. Let's say that for this test, you, decided that the significance level that you will accept is 0 0.05 so your alpha is 0 0.05 with these characteristics we expect that the sampling distribution of the of the mean sample follows a normal distribution with variance x hat that's equal to sigma square divided by n and if the new hypothesis is true the mean of this distribution is 50, which is the mean of the new hypothesis. Why is this normal? Because following the, the, the central limit theorem that we talked about in the last class, the sampling distribution follows, in general, follows a normal distribution. We're gonna talk about this a little bit later in this, in this lecture. And this, vari and this variance is the variance, the sigma, the, the sigma is the true, uh, is the uh, variance, the sigma square is the variance of the population, and this n is the size of your sample. So given all these characteristics, let's define this random variable. This random variable C0 is taking the estimated mean of the sample and resizing it to a normal distribution. So because we're estimating that the mean is mu zero, the new hypothesis mean, we can subtract x from the mu zero, and we divide this by the variance, which is sigma divided by square root of n. Now, if we get this, uh, <clears throat> this sample mean that is normally distribution with this variance 
and this mean, if we subtract this from this mean and we divide it by this value, then z0 will be a random variable that will be distributed following a normal distribution with mean zero and variance one and standard deviation one, sorry. Uh, notice that this is under the new hypothesis, okay? If the new hypothesis is not actually true, then this value of z will follow, will, will fall somewhere else. But if the new hypothesis is true, this equation will generate a random variable that follows n01, okay? So because of this, uh, we have that the probability of the value of z to be between alpha divided by 2 and 1 minus alpha divided by 2 quantiles is as follows. So the probability that z will be smaller than the alpha divided by 2 quantile or bigger than the 1 minus alpha, uh, sorry, uh, the probability that z will fall, will fall between this alpha divided by 2 quantile and the 1 minus alpha divided by 2 quantile if the null hypothesis is true, is one minus alpha. So basically the quantiles we get, for instance, let's say that we have 0 0.05. So we take the 0 0.25 quantile and the 97 point, point, sorry, the 97.5 quantile. And if the probability that Z will follow between these two limits is 0 0.95. So that's our uh, extreme region, okay? So this result allows us to calculate a critical zone for H0 and 1. So if, Z, uh, it, if the quantile alpha divided by 2 of Z is bigger than Z0, or the quantile of 1 minus alpha divided by 2 is smaller than Z0, then we can reject the new hypothesis with confidence 1 minus alpha. If not, then we don't have enough information to reject the new hypothesis. So we must not reject the new hypothesis. Let's calculate this. So assume that we took 10 observations, so our n is 10, and we calculate our point estimator. So our sample mean is 49.65. Also, let's assume that we know that the, populations, the population error is, the population sigma is one kilo. So let's plug those values in the equation. So we have 49.65 minus 50 divided by one the square root of 10 and our value will be minus 1.113. Now, remember that we wanted our significance to be 0 0.05. So we take the quantiles of Z, so the 0, 0, 0.025 quantile and the 0, 0.975 quantile, and these values are minus 1.96 and 1.96. So these are our critical values. If this Z0 falls between these critical values, we cannot reject the new hypothesis. But if it falls outside of these this, uh, this extreme values, then we must reject the new hypothesis. Now, in this case, minus 1.1 is between 1. minus 1.9 and 1.9. So we conclude that the data does not support the rejection of the new hypothesis. Let's think of a different example now. Let's say that we don't know the real variance. In general, like we don't know the values of the population. So let's imagine we don't know sigma, we don't know the real variance. So how do we do this calculation? Okay. Also, let's just change a little bit and say that we're going to use alpha 0 0.01. So we want a test with more confidence. Now, the test hypotheses are the same. Uh, new hypothesis is 50 kilos, alternate hypothesis is different than 50 kilos. However, because we don't know the variance, we cannot use the normal distribution. We have to estimate the variance. So to estimate the variance, the, the estimation of the variance from the sample will change depending on the size of the sample. So we want to use the T distribution because the shape of the T distribution also changes with the numbers of degrees of freedom, which is the numbers of observations in our sample. So in our case, our formula is T0, our test statistic, is x minus mu of 0 divided by s divided by square root of n. This should come from, this is similar to a T distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Okay, 
So this distribution of n minus one degrees of freedom indicates how much information do we have available to calculate this t distribution. So if we plug again, so we use the same data as before. We have the mean of the, the estimated mean is 49.6, n is 10. And let's say that the sample error, the error of the sample is 0 0.697. So now we calculate our test statistic, 49 minus 50, 0 0.6 square root of 10. And the result is minus 1.597. So that's our statistic, okay? Now we need to calculate the critical values. So we have the same way we have the quantile for the T distribution with N minus one degrees of freedom. So it's the quantile of 0 0.005 with nine degrees of freedom is minus 33.24. And because the T distribution like the, like the normal distribution is symmetrical, we know that the extreme, the extreme values is minus 3.24 and 3.24. So under the new hypothesis, there's a 99% chance that the tested statistic will fall between minus 3.2 and 3.2. Now, if we look at this value, minus 1.5 is inside the critical region, so is inside the non-rejecting region. So the result of this test is that we cannot reject the new hypothesis at the 99% confidence level. Okay, uh, we can use this test in R. So you can test this easily in R. So we can generate a sample and we can read the, uh, for instance, here we have a data set. I will upload this data set to the code later so you can test yourself or you can generate your own data. So this could be the data from your experiment. And the t-test function will calculate that. So my sample is your sample. It automatically calculates sample size. Uh, alternative means if we are testing, uh, if our, alter, uh, our alternative hypothesis is different from a value, less than a value or more than a value. So for this example, we're using a one-sided test. So we're testing whether these values is less than this new hypothesis means. So this is mu zero. So this is the new hypothesis mean. And our confidence level here is 0.99. So our R one sample t-test, uh, the data, uh, it says that the data comes from this variable, my sample, it calculates the t-value, minus one, five, nine, six, nine, with nine degrees of freedom. And it so it says here that uh, <clears throat> the 99% confidence interval is minus 250, and says that the calculated mean is 49. So it's inside the confidence interval. Okay. So, when we describe the results of the hypothesis test, what we usually say is that we have insufficient evidence to reject the new hypothesis or sufficient evidence to reject the new hypothesis at the significance level alpha, okay? This, is, this description is like the minimal description. Of course, there is some missing information here. For example, when we say, oh, we don't have enough evidence for, to reject uh, the new hypothesis, it does not say that if this lack of evidence is strong or weak, or if there is evidence to reject the new hypothesis. We don't know if we rejected the new hypothesis by a little bit or, or by a lot. And this is usually useful to know, right? Also, uh, when we say, we're just saying we, uh, we have sufficient evidence, we're saying that this alpha level is appropriate, but maybe the person who is reading wants to know, okay, but what if we do a more strict test? Or what if we do a less strict test? Does this conclusion change? So maybe the reader wants to know that. Also, there is no information about the magnitude of the effect observed. So we can add more information here to, uh, to, the, to our report of the hypothesis test. So let's talk about the p-value. So what is the p-value? The definition of the p-value is that p-value is the lowest significant level that would lead to the rejection of the new hypothesis, given the data that we use. So one way to interpret this is that the p-value is the probability under the new hypothesis that the test statistic would be at least as extreme 
as the value that we observed. For example, we can calculate the p-value on, on the previous example as p-value is the probability that the test statistic is smaller than 1.597, which is the value we observed, when the new hypothesis is true. So this would be the integral from minus infinite to minus 197, and this is for the one-sided test of the uh, of the, the the t9 from zero from minus infinite to uh, 1.59 being equal to, and this probability is 0 0.7237. Okay, so one way to interpret this value is how surprised we see. So the probability, if the new hypothesis is true, the probability that we would see this value or an even smaller value is 0 0.07. So this p-value 0.07 is how surprised we are to see this result. In this case, we are very surprised, but not enough to reject the new hypothesis. So it quantifies the strength of the rejection or the strength of no rejection. Note though that even though we have the new, the, the, even though the p-value is related to alpha, it's still important to define alpha during the experiment design. You cannot calculate the p-value first and then decide if it's significant or not. Before you calculate the p-value, you have to decide, oh, uh, this is the value that I would say it's significant. If you define the significant level after you calculate the p-value, you are doing what people normally say as moving the goalposts. So you calculate the p-value and you see that your p-value is 0 0.1 and you say, oh, my significance value is uh, 0 0.05. Or you see that your p-value is 0 0.001 and you say, no, 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 my significance value for this test is 0 0.001. No, first you define the significance level and after that you calculate the p-value. Because of this, it's also, sometimes you see in paper, people create tables of p-values. Tables of p-values don't give you any information if you don't determine what's the desired significance level a priori, okay? So remember that we can adjust the rejection area for alpha by changing the number of observations. So this means that you can create a p-value as small as you want if you can increase the number of observations in your sample. For example, let's say that our new hypothesis is 500 and the alternate hypothesis is mean divided with 500. Let's say that our n is 5,000, so we have 5,000 observations in our sample. The mean of our sample is 499, so this is our estimated mean, and the error of our sample is five. Notice that the error here is much bigger than the difference between the sample mean and the new hypothesis. So if we think of it as common sense, this difference is not so important. However, when we calculate the p-value, we see that our p-value will be 1.2 times 10 to the minus 23. So this would be 0 0.0000023 zeros my one, okay? It's almost like one mole of p-value. So this p-value is very significant, but the difference is not meaningful, okay? This is especially important for computer science. In computer science, many times you can increase the n very easily by just repeating your experiment. You leave your computer running for one month and you have 5,000 experiments, 10,000 experiments. In those cases, it's very easy to have an arbitrarily small p-value. So it's important before you begin your experiments to determine what is your n, why your n is that size, what is your desired p-value and what are the expected values of p that you can, ex can you, you, you can, you are hoping to see with that sample size, okay? So be very careful to not artificially inflate your p-value. This is also called p-hacking uh, in the literature. Okay, so to tell the whole story of the experiment is necessary to use effect size estimators. So effect size estimators, uh, it, there's, there are people who write whole books on the subject, but the idea is quite simple. 
the idea of an effect size estimator is what is the difference between the alternate hypothesis and the new hypothesis that we are kind of expecting with this experiment? For instance, one way to estimate the effect size is to simply set differ, uh, calculate the difference between the sample mean and the new hypothesis mean. In the example from the previous page, the difference is one gram. And this difference is smaller than the error of the mean. So this looks like a very small effect size. Another way is to do the dimensionless de-estimator. So the de-estimator is the difference between the sample mean and the new hypothesis mean divided by the sample uh, error, okay? So this quantifies the difference in terms of standard deviations. So the idea is that the point estimator and the confidence interval will tell you the magnitude of the facts. So when you're reporting your results, of course, you have to report your p-value, you have to report the significance of your test, but you also have to report the estimated sample effect to say how important is the significant effect that you found, okay? So let's suppose that we're testing the new hypothesis, the mu, uh, mu 50 against an alternate hypothesis, mu different from 50 with 10 samples and alpha 0 0.01. And then we calculate it from the my sample. We have the same values. And we can see here that when you're calculating the t-test in R, and I think that it's probably the same thing for all other statistical uh, programs, uh, you get not only the p-value. So here you have the p-value, 0 0.01. So if your alpha is 0 0.01, you already know that you cannot reject this new hypothesis. However, this is not the whole story. We can also calculate the... Um, <coughs> we can also calculate the confidence interval. So the confidence interval says that with 99% of confidence, the true value of the mean is between 48.9 and 50.3, okay? We cannot reject the hypothesis that it might be exactly 50, but if it's not 50, it should be probably be between these values, okay? All right. Remember though, that as we mentioned uh, in the previous video, this statistical test has many assumptions, technical assumptions and statistical assumptions. For instance, we have the assumption of normality. Uh, there's a typo here. We have assumption of independence, assumption on the value of variance, assumptions about the process, etc. So we need, after we do the analysis, we need to validate the assumptions to avoid bad surprises. Uh, for instance, you are assuming that your data is normal, but when you analyze it, it's actually not normal, or actually the variance is much bigger than you were expecting. So if these assumptions are not validated, uh, your conclusions might be wrong, okay? So it's very important to validate your assumptions when they can be validated through the analysis of your sample data. We're gonna look at some of the validation of the assumptions uh, we're going to talk about more assumptions in future lectures when we talk about other tests. In the case of the z-test and the t-test that we studied in this lecture, uh, we have first the assumption of normality. So the assumption of normality, okay, it, it's not about the observations. It's not that the, the observations follow a normal distribution. The assumptions of normality is that the estimation of the mean, in other words, the statistic that you calculate from your sample that calculates the estimated mean of the population from the mean of sample is, follows a normal distribution. Now, this thing that we might, we have to remember is that in general, we can expect the, uh, the, uh, the estimation of normal, uh, the, the assumption of normalcy to be followed because the CLT is actually quite strong. However, there are other cases that uh, we are not, we don't, we don't care only about the normality of the um, sample mean, but we also worry about the normalcy of the observations. In that case, there are many ways to, to, to test if the observations follow a normal distribution or not. First, there's one way to estimate, to, to check if the, uh, if the observations follow a normal distribution or not, is to do a QQ plot. A QQ plot, which means quantile quantile plot, is this plot that we are looking right here in this slide. It plots 
one set of data against another set of data. And when one of the set of data is the theoretical normal quantiles and the other set of data is the data from your experiment, the QQ plot will show if the data from your experiment roughly follows a normal distribution or not. Okay, so if the, plot, if the data follows a normal distribution, it will generally stay close to this line. It will be a straight line. In this case, we see some minor deviations from normal. So here we can see that this data, it might slightly different from normal at the extremes. Okay, uh, of course, because the CLT is very robust, small definitions of small deviations of normal are still okay for the Z and the T test. However, other tests might require stronger assumptions of normality. You have to check that uh, depending on the test that you are actually using. If you want to test normality, like the visual inspection is of course not very strong, uh, you need to do a decision like how much deviation from here should you, uh, should you accept. So you can do st a statistical test to test if a, date, if a set of data followed the normal distribution or not. Now there are several tests of normalcy, such as the Shapiro-Wilk test, the Anderson-Darling test, the Komogorov test, etc. In this course, we're gonna recommend the Shapiro-Wilk, we're gonna use the Shapiro-Wilk, but depending on the situation, you might want to use the other tests. So it's worth taking a look at them and seeing what are the assumptions, what are the conditions. The procedures of these tests is the same uh, new hypothesis testing procedure that we had before. Here, the new hypothesis is that the population from which the observations were taken follows a normal distribution. And the alternate hypothesis is that the, the population from which the, no, the observations were taken does not follow a normal distribution. And in this case, a rejection of the new hypothesis is evidence that the sample came from a normal distribution. However, as I said before, if the sample is big enough, the CLT might guarantee a normally distributed sample mean estimate, okay? Now, a more important and more stronger assumption is the assumption of independence used in the t-test and the z-test. So the idea of the assumption of independence is that each observation is not dependent, the value of each observation does not depend on the values of the other observations. The value of the, each observation depends only on the parameters of the population. When does this happen? For instance, let's say that we, are, we have a robot and we are measuring the value of the robot. However, this robot has a battery and because you did not charge the battery before the, ex, the, before the experiment, the battery of the robot is weak. Because the battery of the robot is weak, the first, the, first, the, the first time the robot runs, it runs at full speed. The second time, it runs a little bit slower. The third time, it runs a little bit slower. The fourth time, it runs a little bit slower. Now, every time it's run slower, it's running slower because the previous observation used the battery. So there is a relationship between the observations. So the observations are not independent, okay? Now, a second example. Let's say that we, are, we develop an algorithm to do time series prediction. Okay, so our algorithm does time series prediction. However, so to test this algorithm, we get 20 different time series and we try to predict all these 20 time series and we see how well the algorithm predicts them. However, five of these time series comes from the same model. Let's say that we have five time series from solar data of different, day, of different years. And the other 50 time series are from completely different cases. Each time series, each of the 15 different, each of the 15 other time series is from a completely different domain. What happens is that these five time series that comes from the sun data, they are very correlated. So the value, their values is much closer than the values of the rest. So these five, time series, they come from one distribution and the other 15, they come from another distribution. So this invalidates the independence uh, assumption of the t-test. So in general, we want to guarantee the independence assumption. However, it's very hard to do an analytical test 
for independence. The best way to guarantee independence is to make sure that in your experiment design level, you guarantee the independence. You make sure that you charge the battery of the robot, or even better, you charge the battery before every experiment. And you make sure that all your time series, they are either all from the same class category or they're all from different class category. You don't have some from different class categories and some from the same class categories because then you're gonna have different distributions. If you have, uh, there is a, the Durbin Watson test is a test that can calculate autocorrelation. So it can test if the first uh, observation is related to the second observation that is related to the third observation. So the DW test would, would detect correctly the first violation of, the first example of violation of independence, but the DW test would not detect the second example of violation of independence, okay? So it's kind of hard to rely only on the statistical tests to detect violation of independence. You need really to really be careful when you design your experiment. Okay. So to conclude this lecture, in this lecture, we describe a framework for statistical testing. We introduce the concept of hypothesis testing, which is a way to use data obtained from an experiment to make a conclusion about a population. This puts two hypotheses against each other. A new hypothesis, there is no any special uh, effect, and an alternate hypothesis, there is a special effect that we have observed. Okay? To do the, the new hypothesis testing, we follow the following steps. First, we formulated the question of interest. We create the new hypothesis that we are studying. Second, we defined the minimally interesting effect. So we define what is the minimal value that we are interested in observing. Based on the new hypothesis and the minimal interesting effect, we define what is the confidence, what is the alpha that we desire for this test, and what is the power, what is the beta that we desire for this test? So we calculate, based on alpha and beta, we calculate the sample size, how many observations we need for a sample. Now notice that we did not talk today about calculation of sample size. There will be a future lecture that will focus on this topic, okay? Then we collect the data. So after we calculate the sample size, now we can do the experiment. We know that we need 20 samples or 15 samples or 17 samples, okay? After we collect the data, we do the statistical analysis. We calculate the statistic, the Z statistic or the T statistic. And we also calculate the assumptions. We calculate if the data is normal, we calculate the variance that we assumed, assumed et cetera. Finally, based on the statistic, on the T statistic or the Z statistic, we can calculate our p-value and we can calculate our effect size. And based on the p-value and the effect size, we can say, oh, we reject the new hypothesis and we estimate that the difference between the new mean and the actual mean is about this much. Or we can say, no, we could, did not reject the new hypothesis and we calculate a confidence interval for the mean of this much, okay? So this is, the procedure of new hypothesis testing. Now, in future lectures, we will study variations and special cases of this testing procedure. In this lecture, we talk about the new hypothesis of one sample. In the next lecture, we're gonna talk about new hypothesis testing for two samples. When you compare algorithm A and algorithm B, how do you do new hypothesis for that case? Also, in the lecture after that, we're gonna talk about calculation of sample size. Now, there's two very recommended reads for this lecture. The first recommended read is this statistical significance versus practical significance. And this is a very nice summary of the topics that we talk about this lecture. What is new hypothesis? What is alternate hypothesis? What is p-value? What is confidence? What is power? So this is a quick read. I think it's like three pages. So make sure to read this first. The second is assumptions of normality. It says why uh, the normal, normality is important for the new hypothesis testing, uh, its relationship with the central limit theorem, and when we can expect the, no, the, 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 the normal the assumption to be uh, validated and when we can expect it to be uh, um, 
to be validated. So I really recommend these two readings for this uh, for this lecture. Thank you very much, and see you next week.